In 2019, a political scientist by the name of Arthur Brooks, he published an article in the New York Times entitled, Our Culture of Contempt. Now, in that article, he, he makes what has become a, a pretty common observation among social scientists and cultural commentators. This observation that we live during a time of incredible polarization and that our divisions, especially our political divisions, have affected families, friendships, churches, almost every kind of American community has felt the effect of these divisions and conflicts. But where does all of this come from? And why do our divisions seem to be so heated these days? It's not like this is the first time we've disagreed with each other. So why are they so heated? Well, in response to that question, Brooks cited an article that had been published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. This article that researchers were talking about something they called motive attribution asymmetry, which is basically a fancy way of describing what happens when people attribute good motives to their own opinions and assume that those who disagree with them are not only wrong, but are motivated by hate or resentment or envy or something like that. And these researchers who were studying this, they found that the level of motivation attribution asymmetry between Republicans and Democrats is basically equivalent to that between Israelis and Palestinians. In other words, we don't just have political disagreements or divisions, we think that those who disagree with us are despicable and hateful and unworthy of our respect. As Brooks himself put it, people often say that our problem in America today is incivility or intolerance. This is incorrect. Motive attribution asymmetry leads to something far worse, contempt, which is a noxious brew of anger and disgust and not just contempt for other people's ideas, but also for other people. In the words of the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, contempt is the unsullied conviction of the worthlessness of another. Now, Brooks might be correct that we live during a time of, of heightened mutual contempt, but contempt isn't a modern phenomenon. Contempt has been around a long time. In fact, in one of his kingdom stories, Jesus talks about this tendency we have to feel contempt and about how it can be avoided. It's a story that's recorded in Luke chapter 18. And in introducing it, Luke actually tells us, Luke tells us exactly who Jesus had in mind when he told the story. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. It's pretty clear in the context of Luke that the people Jesus has especially in mind are the Pharisees. He's already had multiple conflicts with them in the Gospel of Luke, and he chooses a Pharisee as a character in the story. And this wouldn't have come as any great surprise to the other Jews who were listening when Jesus told this story either. Pharisees, they had a bit of a reputation as being holier than thou. In fact, the ancient Jewish historian Josephus at one point describes them by saying, the Pharisees are a certain sect of the Jews that appear more religious than others and seem to interpret the laws more accurately. But I think that Luke was intentional in the way he described the audience. He doesn't say that Jesus told the story to some Pharisees but to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. And that doesn't just mean Pharisees, because they're not the only ones who think of themselves as better than other people and who tend to treat others with contempt. But enough about that. What is the story that Jesus tells them? Well, he says that one day, two different men go to the temple to pray. One's a Pharisee, and one's a tax collector. The Pharisee prays by thanking God that he isn't like other men, such as that tax collector in the corner over there. 
while the tax collector simply says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then after describing their two prayers, Jesus says about the tax collector, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That seems simple enough, right? Don't be arrogant or proud if you want to be right with God. Instead, be humble and God will look kindly on you. So that's a theme that comes up all throughout the Bible. And it seems that Jesus is just reemphasizing it here with a memorable story about some arrogant jerk and then a much kinder, humbler man. Makes sense which of the two God approves of. I mean, who wouldn't like the tax collector better? Like I said, it seems pretty straightforward. And because of that, we might be tempted to read over it quickly and think, yeah, okay, I get the point. But this familiar story deserves closer attention. Well, take this Pharisee, for instance. Like I said, he, he comes across as just a sort of proud, arrogant jerk. And most people who re hear this story will take an immediate dislike to him. But if you think about it, he's actually a pretty upstanding person, at least by most standards. He's honest in his business dealings. He's faithful to his wife. He's careful to avoid treating people unjustly. And he also seems pretty sincere and devoted in his religion. It's not just a show. It's not just some small part of his life. He, he fasts twice a week. And he gives a tenth of all that he gets back to God. What's more, although Luke says that Jesus is correcting people who trust in themselves that they are righteous, this Pharisee in his prayer, he doesn't take credit for his own good behavior and his own good character. To the contrary, he gives thanks to God for it. God, I thank you. That's how he begins. And you might think that, well, he's just, he's not being sincere. But Jesus doesn't say anything about the sincerity of his prayer. So there's a good chance that he really means what he says. Honestly, if you think about it, this, this Pharisee is pretty much the model of a good, decent churchgoer, the kind of person most of us would be glad to have in our congregation on a Sunday morning. And that is not the case with this tax collector. Tax collectors, they may not have been the worst sinners in the ancient world, but in the culture of ancient Judaism, they were pretty close to the bottom. There's a reason that people were scandalized when Jesus ate with tax collectors, and there's a reason that they tended to be grouped together with prostitutes and other notorious public sinners, because these tax collectors, they were traitors to their own people getting rich and fat off collaborating with their pagan Roman overlords. And their tendency to cheat people and take more than was due and skim off the top, it was legendary. Everybody knew that. Because there are so many stories in the Gospels about Jesus showing mercy to them, and because there are stories about tax collectors like Matthew and Zacchaeus, who find redemption in Jesus. I think most of us are inclined to feel sympathy when we read about people mistreating tax collectors or judging them. But if you remember that right before coming into the temple that day, that tax collector may very well have been fleecing some poor Jewish family to line his own pockets. It might be easier to understand why that Pharisee felt the contempt he did. And why this story might have been more shocking or more unsettling to Jesus' original audience than it is to us today. And here's another thing. How many times, how many times had that tax collector gone into that temple and prayed that same prayer? We like to think that just like Zacchaeus, he went home that day and he started making restitution to everyone he'd wronged, returning the money he'd stolen maybe making some charitable donations to good causes. But Jesus doesn't say that. He doesn't say anything about his change of character, nor does he say whether or not this was the tax collector's 
first time to come in the temple and cry and beat his breast and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Maybe this was something he did every week. Maybe he'd been doing this for years. And if that's true, would you really feel the same goodwill toward him? If that's true, don't you think you might feel at least a little bit of contempt? Is it really that admirable for a cheating, thieving traitor to just admit he's wrong and needs help? I think that if we're going to let this story have the impact on us that it should, then we need to, we need to really sit with those questions and try to understand what was going through that Pharisee's mind. Try to have some sympathy with him. Why he felt the scorn he did for that tax collector. Because if we don't, we'll never realize just how similar our own hearts sometimes are to the heart of the Pharisee. But what is Jesus trying to teach us then in this story? How should this story change the way we think about God and ourselves and the world around us? Well, to start with, this story is a direct challenge to our tendency to divide the world up into good people and bad people, successful people and entitled people, lazy people and, and hardworking people, and of all the hundreds of other categories that we constantly use to evaluate the people around us. Because according to this story, the big difference between the Pharisee and tax collector isn't that one is a respectable, devoted, hardworking, God-fearing man, and the other is a sinner in need of mercy. The truth is, the truth that Jesus is communicating is that they're both sinners in desperate need for mercy. They are both, as St. Paul says in Ephesians, they are both really just dead corpses who need to be resurrected. The only difference between them is that the tax collector knows he's dead and helpless and in desperate need of mercy. The tax collector understands who he is. The Pharisee, the Pharisee on the other hand, he, he's blissfully ignorant of his true condition. He's just living a lie. He thinks that he's doing pretty well because he lives in a world of comparisons. He's always comparing himself to other people and compared to that guy over there, he's not doing too bad. Now, sure, he may not be perfect, the Pharisee never claims to be perfect, but he's no thief. He goes to church, he tithes, he reads his Bible, he's been faithful to his wife. And that means he's doing a whole lot better than some people he could think of. In other words, this Pharisee is, he's really a perfect representative of the divided and contemptuous time in which we live. If that Pharisee were around today, no doubt he'd be thanking God that he goes to the right kind of church and reads the right kind of news, source, news sources and has, has the right political opinions, not like some other people he could think of. And if that tax collector were around today, you know what I think he'd be doing? I think he'd be doing pretty much exactly what he's doing in the story. He would be grieving over his own sin, confessing it to God and saying, God have mercy on me, a sinner. C.S. Lewis once wrote an essay where he was responding to the complaint that sometimes made, this complaint about the prayers of confession of sin in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. Why all this constant talk about sin and why, why all these prayers acknowledging that we are wretched and in need of mercy? Don't such prayers promote a kind of morbid and unhealthy spirituality? Well, Lewis doesn't think so, and he tries to defend not only these prayers, but also defend the importance of learning to name and acknowledge our own sins and vices for what they really are. And then right near the end of the essay, he says, does that sound very gloomy? Does Christianity encourage morbid introspection? Well, the alternative is much more morbid. Those who do not think about their own sins make up for it by thinking incessantly of the sins of others. Of course, Lewis wasn't the first person to make that observation. Jesus himself was fully aware that those who do not think about their own sins 
make up for it by thinking incessantly of the sins of others. And he told a story that illustrates just that fact. One day, a Pharisee and a tax collector went into the temple to pray. One went home right with God, and one did not. And the question that you must ask for yourself as you're reading this is, which one are you? Do you think well of yourself? Do you feel contempt for those that are obviously worse than you? Is your prayer God Thank you that I am not like other men? Or is your prayer, God have mercy on me, a sinner?